There we go. So if you think about photoautotrophs, those might include things like plants, right? Plants are a very obvious photoautotroph. But also things like algae or um, cyanobacteria, which are small microorganisms here. Uh, different protists, which are also very small uh, microorganisms. They also have the ability uh, to perform photosynthesis, to make their own food, right? But plants are the ones we're going to be focusing on because this class is about plants here. So if we look at a broad overview of photosynthesis, right, this is the main way that plants are going to be using light, right? And very broadly, right, we are capturing that energy from the sun and um, using it to produce sugars or to produce carbohydrates, right? And uh, this is a nice little cartoon image here. We see sunlight is going in, right? Plants also need carbon dioxide to go in, right? And as a result of photosynthesis, they are going to be producing sugars and releasing some oxygen. All right, if we think about um, the energy cycle overall, right, um, we could say that the energy cycle, right, is the cycling between using photosynthesis and using cellular respiration, right? So the energy cycle, cells use organic molecules for energy, right? So that'd be things like sugars, carbohydrates, right? We can consume these or we can make them, right? And then plants replenish those molecules using photosynthesis, right? So it's this, it's this cycle, right? And if we think about, we have our organic molecules here. They're going to be used for energy through a process of cellular respiration. Right? Once they're used up, right, we gotta make some more, which is where photosynthesis comes into play. And once again, we have our organic molecules that can repeat this cycle over and over. Right. Now in this process, plants also produce oxygen, which is super helpful for us, right? We like oxygen. I want to do just a brief overview of cellular respiration, just enough for you to understand the basics. We're not going to go into the steps of cellular respiration, right? Um, but cellular respiration, we're using those organic molecules, right? We're obtaining energy from organic molecules. A lot of times these are carbohydrates, and a lot of times these are sugars like glucose. Right? The primary aim is to make this molecule called ATP, which I am sure you have at least heard of, if not way back when in high school. Right? Uh, ATP is this a great molecule that essentially provides energy for a lot of different processes in the cell. Right? Um, ATP would be this top molecule here, right? Adenine triphosphate, right? Triphosphate meaning it has three phosphate groups. You can see that as these three orange dots here, right? When one of these phosphate groups breaks, it releases some energy, and that energy can be harnessed by cells to do work, right? Whatever the cell needs to do, right? It then makes a DP, which is adenine diphosphate, so it only has two phosphate groups, right? And when another phosphate group is added back on to turn it once again into ATP, right, we're capturing some of that energy that can be once again used once that phosphate group is lost, right? So ATP, major molecule in the cell here, right? Primary goal of cellular respiration is to make ATP. Um, most respiration is going to use oxygen, right? Uh, we're going to use oxygen and release carbon dioxide, right? You can see there's many different processes in cellular respiration. Like I said, we're not going to go through all these steps like I would in a Bio 101 class, right? But throughout all of these steps, right, we're producing ATP, right? The last step gives us a lot of ATP. We are using oxygen, right? And we're releasing uh, carbon dioxide, right? Um, so cellular respiration, we're using those organic molecules. All right. Plants use cellular respiration. Right? Sometimes when I teach about cellular respiration, we think of only animals using cellular respiration. 
because animals are heterotrophs. They have to consume organic molecules and break those organic molecules down, whereas plants can make their own food, right? which is great. They can make their own sugars, but they still have to go through cellular respiration to use those sugars, right? So plants need energy as well. We need to make those ATP molecules. They are also going to use uh, cellular respiration, right? Um, we can think of cellular respiration as being really prominently used in plants in um, trees that are dormant. So the trees outside right now, they're not dead, all right? They're still living, right? They need to um, get energy to live through the winter, right? They're going through cellular respiration right now, right? They don't have leaves. They're not photosynthesizing. They're solely relying on cellular respiration, right? Most of the time, there'll be an interchange between we're photosynthesizing and using cellular respiration. All right, if we think about where this is happening, right, and we've gone a little bit into leaf anatomy, so I want to reorient ourselves here, right? If we're thinking about a cross section of a leaf, right, so we've cut a leaf in half, we're looking on the inside here, we have our mesophyll cells. Right, which would fall under the category of parenchyma cells. Okay. Our mesophyll cells here are going to function in photosynthesis. Right? And I mentioned previously we have two types of mesophyll. We have palisade mesophyll cells, which are these really elongated cells towards the top of a leaf. Okay. They have a lot of chloroplasts inside of them right? because they are getting most of the light that the leaf is capturing. Right? That's why we're at the top part of the leaf. The light is coming in. It's immediately being captured by these palisade mesophylls that are just packed full of chloroplasts. Okay. Underneath these palisade mesophyll cells, we have spongy mesophyll cells. Okay. So these spongy mesophyll cells, um, they're more globular in shape. They're not columnar like the palisade mesophylls. They're really scattered throughout. Okay. They still function in photosynthesis. They still have chloroplasts. They're getting kind of the, the leftover light, right, as it moves through this leaf here, right? But there's also a lot of different spaces between these cells, right? And that spaces, or those spaces allow for increased surface area to exchange gases, all right? So through photosynthesis, we're releasing oxygen. That oxygen will um, inhabit that space around those spongy mesophyll cells before it eventually exits the leaf through the stomata. Right. Now we have one other cell type, right? We have bundle sheath cells, right? Which are not found in all plants. Only certain plants have these bundle sheath cells. They are, if you look at the vascular bundle here where we have our xylem and our phloem, those bundle of sheath cells are in blue, kind of surrounding our vascular bundle, right? And they help to regulate what is actually moving into the xylem and the phloem. Right. Um, we'll touch on bundle sheath cells a little bit more when we talk um, some more physio physiology about plants here. But it was depicted on this image, so I wanted to kind of uh, let you know that terminology right now. All right, but inside those cells, like I mentioned, we have chloroplasts. Right. So chloroplast, that is the specific organelle where photosynthesis is occurring. Right? If a cell doesn't have a chloroplast organelle in it, it's not going to photosynthesize. Right? So chloroplasts are key. Inside of those chloroplasts, we have chlorophyll. Right? So chloroplast is the organelle, right? membrane-bound organelle. Chlorophyll is a molecule. It's a pigment that's embedded inside of our chloroplast. And this is the pigment that actually captures the light. Right? So the green pigment, and why we see our leaves are green is because of chlorophyll. Um, majority, like of photosynthesis, like I said, is gonna happen in those mesophyll cells. Right? And then carbon dioxide and oxygen are going to enter and exit the leaves through the stomata. Right, the stomata are those openings. I'm trying to slow down in my lectures to give you more time to type here. Right, we see our stomata on our image here. 
um, mesophyll, both the palisade and the spongy mesophyll are present. I did want to do a quick aside here since I talked about stomata, right? Uh, so what is the difference between stomata and guard cells, right? There is a difference. Often stomata is used to talk about guard cells and that would be incorrect way of using the term stomata. Stomata is the actual opening. It's the hole in the leaves, right? Versus the guard cells, the guard cells are the cells surrounding that opening, right? That regulate whether or not the stomata are open or closed, right? So oftentimes, um, if I am looking through a microscope and I see the stomata, students will say, oh, that's the stomata and point towards the guard cells. Right, well, the stomata is actually the, the pore, the opening itself. The guard cells are the cells that regulate whether that pore is open or closed. All right, there is even more anatomy to learn as we dive deeper into our leaves here. So we have our leaves. We're in our mesophyll cells that are photosynthesizing, right? The organelle in those cells are the chloroplasts, right? The chloroplasts themselves have some anatomy that we need to understand in order to uh, learn about how exactly does a plant photosynthesize and make those sugars. So if we look at a chloroplast, right, they actually have two membranes. Right? They have an outer membrane and they have this inner membrane. Right? In between those two membranes, we have a space which we would call the intermembrane space. Right, so they have two membranes, but they also have a third series of membranes. Right, so beyond just the organelle membrane itself, so the outer and the inner membrane, we have these thylakoids. Right, so these thylakoid membranes here, this is the area where our chlorophyll pigments are actually embedded in our chloroplasts. Right, so we have our plasma membranes, right, just like we see on the outside of our organelle. There's also a whole system of plasma membranes inside of our thylakoids here. Right? And embedded in those membranes are our pigment molecules, our chlorophyll. Right? A whole stack of these thylakoids, which are these little disc-like shaped shapes here, right? a whole stack of them would be called a granum. And if we look inside of a thylakoid or inside of one of those discs, there's going to be a space that is filled with fluid, and we would say that is the stoma, or excuse me, the, the stroma is actually outside. Inside of the thylakoid is the lumen, right? So let me back up and rephrase that, all right? We have our thylakoid, which is our disc. We have a granum, which is a stack of our discs. Inside of the thylakoids is what's called the lumen, right? Outside of the thylakoids, right, surrounding all of our thylakoids, is this fluid-filled space called the stroma, right? So this area outside of all of our thylakoids, right? Now, before I have you practice this terminology here, I want to briefly mention that photosynthesis when we really dive into it tomorrow, we're going to talk about two stages, right? And the chloroplasts, right, are going to be involved in both stages, but in different areas of those chloroplast organelles. So we would have the light reactions as one stage, right? This is the reaction that actually harnesses the light energy from the sun. And then we would have the Kelvin cycle in the other stage. Sometimes it's called the light reactions and the dark reactions. The dark reactions being the Kelvin cycle. Right? So the Kelvin cycle is actually uh, what is producing these glucose molecules, producing those sugars. Right? The light reactions, they're taking place in the thylakoids, right? using those pigments embedded within all those uh, thylakoid membranes. The Kelvin cycle, still happening in the chloroplasts, what is happening in the stroma, right? It's the fluid-filled region around our thylakoids. And we'll go into more detail on this tomorrow. But let's do a review slide. 
Um, so I want you to look at our image here, uh, label the anatomy. We did not talk about number six. You could ignore six here. All right. Um, and then I want you to think about where in this anatomy, what number would represent where the light reactions take place. So I'll give you a couple minutes here. Still hear some discussion, so I'll give you uh, like another few seconds here. anatomy together. Uh, so let's start with uh, number one. What is number one showing us here? It's a membrane. Yep. Which one? The inner membrane. Yes. So what is the inner membrane? Um, what about, let's jump to number three. What is number three? Outer membrane, which means number two is Intermembrane space, yes, the space between those two membranes. All right, what about uh, number four? It's depicting the space around the internal structures. Stroma? Yeah, stroma, right, which would mean number five that we're looking at here would be? Thylakoid. The thylakoid. And what would a stack of those thylakoids be? A granum, yes, which is not shown in this image here. Um, I, we're not talking about number six, which is a lamella, which is kind of like a membrane bridge between thylakoids. Um, we're not going to get that specific into um, chloroplast anatomy here. Uh, but where do the light reactions take place? Which one of these structures? Yeah, the thylakoid. Yeah, that, that structure of all those different membranes. Right, we'll see why membranes play such an important role uh, tomorrow. Any questions on chloroplast anatomy? All right, we're going to keep charging along here then. So we're going to talk about light. Right? We have to understand light before we can talk about um, how light is used. 
So I did have you uh, look at those resources for the quiz today. So I'm going to review kind of what you already learned, right? Light is this type of electromagnetic radiation, right? We can see uh, the electromagnetic uh, spectrum here, right? all that light that is available, right? It's going to be traveling as waves, and we can see depending on the type of light that we are, well, I don't want to say looking at because we can only see the visible light, the type of light that is present, right, gamma rays, right, tend to have these really short wavelengths. They're really close together. Whereas uh, things like radio waves tend to have these really long wavelengths. The wavelengths are far apart, right? So they're traveling as waves. Different types of light have different uh, wavelengths associated with them. Um, we can also think of light energy as behaving as particles called photons, right? Um, so photons would be like a discrete package of light, right? And it's this packaging of light that carries the energy to the leaves themselves, right? And shorter wavelengths of light, right? So wavelengths that are closer together have more energy associated with them than the longer wavelengths, right? So the longer wavelengths on the other end of the spectrum. Right, so light energy, um, talk about them as photons, these discrete packages. They have energies associated with them based on the length of their wavelengths. Right. We're thinking about photosynthesis and plants. Plants are using the visible light spectrum for photosynthesis. Right. But they can also utilize a little bit on either side of the visible light spectrum. We'll see especially today how they use infrared light as well. But we're looking at this visible light spectrum, so just a small sliver into the total amount of electromagnetic radiation that is out there. Right. So I talked about chlorophyll, and chlorophyll is a pigment. Right. So these photons, these packages of light, are going to hit a pigment, right? And a pigment is going to be a molecule that absorbs only a certain wavelength of light, right? Uh, so our chlorophyll pigments, they're not absorbing every wavelength in the visible spectrum, right? They're only absorbing very specific wavelengths themselves, typically in the red and blue uh, visible light spectrum. When these photons hit these pigments, a couple of things can happen, right? So first of all, uh, they can be transmitted through the pigment, right? So we can see light here. It can be transmitted through, right? It really is kind of unaffected. Right? This light can be a uh, reflected light, right? So it's going to hit our pigments and it's gonna bounce back out. It's gonna be reflected out. Typically what is reflected out is going to be the wavelengths that are not being used, right? So in a chloroplast, in chlorophyll, right, we have our molecule of chlorophyll down here, right? We're not going to be using green light. Green light is actually reflected back, which is why we see leaves as green. It's the light that they are not actually using. It's what is being reflected back towards our eyes. But a third thing can happen here. Right? This light can be absorbed, right? Uh, so these pigments can absorb these lights, uh, this light and actually harness the energy in those photons and go through um, processes like photosynthesis, right? So light can be transmitted through, it can be reflected back towards us, or it can be absorbed and actually used. All right, so we're going to think about what happens when the light is absorbed, right? So when light is absorbed, it's actually going to interact with the electrons in our atoms. So again, we're going to back up a little bit, just make sure everybody has the same terminology here. So if we're thinking about an atom, right, it's the smallest functional unit of organization, right? We can get smaller than an atom. So for example, an atom is made up of subatomic particles of electrons, protons, and neutrons. 
right? But functionally, right, an atom is the smallest unit. Okay? So in our atom, right, we have our nucleus, and that consists of our protons and our neutrons. And what's encircling our nucleus would be our electrons. Right? So our electrons are in these different orbits around our uh, nucleus here. Right? We can see our electrons, they are negatively charged. So if we think back to ions, right? We talked about atoms when we talked about ions. Ions are either have lost or gained an electron to make it have a charge. Right? When we combine different atoms together, right, we group them together, they're bonded together, we would say we have our molecule. Right? So Electrons. We're going to pay particular focus to these electrons here. Right? Because when light is absorbed, when light is captured, right, uh, it's going to excite these electrons. Right? So essentially when light is absorbed, it's going to boost these electrons to a higher energy level or a higher energy state. So if we look at this image here, right, we have our nucleus in the middle. We have our electrons in these orbits around our nucleus. When a photon of light right, is absorbed by uh, this electron, this electron is going to be excited. Right? And when it gets excited, it's essentially going to jump an orbit to be further out from the nucleus. Right? We can see that this electron is in this inner orbit here. It gets excited. It jumps up to this outer orbit. Right? Now, when these electrons are excited, right? Uh, they're in a very unstable state, right? These electrons uh, don't want to be in this unstable state. So essentially, they have to lose that energy that they gained in order to go back down to what's called this ground state here, to where they're normally going to be found orbiting this atom. So, excited electron, right? Very unstable. Right? We got to lose this energy. This energy is going to be lost in a couple of different ways. Right? So the electron can release the energy in the form of heat. Right? Um, so heat can release that energy. If you've ever driven in on a hot day and seen some um, um, of that heat being released off of that blacktop that you're driving on, right? it's releasing that energy. It can be released as light. Right? So a lot of different organisms. Uh, beyond plants, will actually release light in this form of bioluminescence here. So those bioluminescent uh, jellyfish are a great example. Right? But they can also be transferred to another molecule. Right? That energy, uh, those excited electrons can actually leave the atom itself, be transferred to another molecule, and be captured. Okay? This is what happens during photosynthesis. Right? is instead of that energy being released as light or heat, it's actually going to be transferred to another molecule completely. All right, let's elaborate on a, a couple of things here. All right, so chlorophyll, we're absorbing that energy, right? We're exciting those electrons. So when a photon strikes chlorophyll, right, we look at our chlorophyll molecule here, right? We typically have what's called the chlorophyll head. It's this ring structure, and it's actually doing the absorption of the light. Right? This tail structure right, is actually what holds it in place in the uh, membranes of the thylakoid. Right? But this head is where the light is going to strike our chlorophyll and be absorbed. Right? That electron is going to become excited and be raised to this higher energy state. Now, like I said, Different wavelengths of light carry different amounts of energy associated with them. Now in chlorophyll, right, chlorophyll can absorb red and blue uh, wavelengths of light, right? So red and blue out of those photons. And if we look at the wavelengths of light, right, this blue light has a shorter wavelength associated with it, which means it's going to carry more energy. So when this blue light hits this electron, it's going to give it even more energy, right? More energy than, say, red light would give that electron. Because red light has a longer wavelength and carries less energy, right? So blue light really excites these electrons, 
gives it even more energy than, say, the red light would excite those electrons. Right? So connecting the dots between light and the energy associated with light and how that physically works with our electrons. All right, so once that energy is captured, like I said, we can do a couple of different things. We can, it can be released as heat, it can be released as light, or it could be captured by another molecule. Right? Now on plants, some of this energy can actually be released as light. Right? It's not going to be a bioluminescent light like the jellyfish. Right? We're not going to be able to see it um, in the dark, for example. Right? But a small portion of that energy will be released as light. And we would say it produces this fluorescence. Right? It's going to fluoresce a little bit. But only about 2% of that light is going to cause fluorescence. Right? And like I said, this light, we can't really see it. Right? We have to use different instruments to actually see this light uh, being fluoresced back to us. Right? Um, map, right? because there's, there's no plants to fluoresce anymore. All right, so a small portion of a plant fluoresces. Right? Or fluoresces right? And I know in that video it said you need to have instruments on satellites to see this. I would amend that and say you can use other instruments that are not on satellites. Uh, we have an instrument in the, our own department here that basically clamps onto a leaf and can measure the amount of fluorescence. Right? So you don't have to have a satellite. There are other instruments out there that can do this, but they are very expensive. Right? All right, so chlorophyll pigments, excited electrons. We can release this energy as light, just a small portion. Most of it, though, is going to be um, absorbed and transferred to another molecule. Okay? We would call this resonance energy transfer. Right? So we have our chlorophyll pigment. Right? And in fact, we have a group of pigments. It's not just one chlorophyll pigment. They're actually grouped together in these complexes that we would call an antenna complex. Right? So an antenna complex is made up of a couple hundred of chlorophyll pigments. And what happens is that we have light striking a singular pigment in that antenna complex right? that excites a singular electron in that pigment here. Right? That electron right, has all this energy. It's very unstable. It needs to be uh, moved to a different molecule. It needs to be captured by another molecule. So this electron is essentially going to bounce from pigment to pigment to pigment until it reaches the center of this complex. That center is called the reaction center. And it's in this center that this electron finally stops bouncing between all those different pigment molecules and is captured by a molecule. Right? So all these pigments are working in tandem here. They are mostly chlorophyll pigments. Right? We can have other pigments scattered in. We can see in here we have a pigment called beta carotene. Right? It's essentially absorbing a slightly different wavelength than what chlorophyll would absor absorb. Right? But does the same thing. Right? That electron will be excited, bounce, 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 reach that reaction center. And we can see once it reaches that reaction center, it's going to be accepted by a molecule, right? completely transferred over. All right, so you saw in that antenna complex, I mentioned there's beta carotene. It's a different pigment, right? There are more pigments out there than just chlorophyll. There are a ton of pigments out there. Um, we often call them accessory pigments. So they're pigments that um, can aid in photosynthesis, but they can um, do many other things as well, all right? So they can give their energy to chlorophyll. So for example, beta carotene here, Right? If we look at this chart, right, we have wavelengths of light across the bottom, right, and we have the light that is being absorbed across the side. Right? And A and B here are our chlorophylls. Right? So there's two variations on our chlorophyll molecule. Um, they really only vary by um, one, uh, one atom, all right? so very slight variation. They capture 
this light kind of in this blue, um, bluish green spectrum here, right? That's where they're really good at capturing light, which is why we see a peak at these wavelengths, right? They also peak a little bit in the red light, right? We can see they're really good at capturing light uh, in that red spectrum as well. But they're really bad at capturing this like green to yellow to orange light. This is where those accessory pigments come into play, right? Uh, carotenoids like beta carotene, like you saw on the previous um, slide here, they can um, be really good at absorbing light in those wavelengths that chlorophyll cannot absorb, right? So they basically extend the amount of light that a plant can actually use in photosynthesis, right? So they can extend the wavelengths for photosynthesis, right? Um, and actually in the fall, when you see the colors changing, right, we are starting to see all those accessory pigments come through. Because what happens is we have our leaves, right, they're, they're green throughout the summer, then it hits fall time, those pigments, the chlorophyll pigments, will actually be broken down and reabsorbed back into the plant. Right? What's left behind are all those other pigments, those carotenoids. Uh, that typically show up as like those orange and reds and yellows, right? Those really beautiful colors are all those accessory pigments that are now being shown through because the majority of chlorophyll has left, right? Um, but typically we have a, a lot of chlorophyll, which is why during the summer months when we see our leaves as green, we're really seeing the chlorophyll because they mask the effect of any of those other pigments showing through, right? These accessory pigments can also be used in protection, right? So for plants, light is great, but like everything, too much of something can be bad, right? So too much of a good thing is bad, and so if they get too much light, right, they could, um, it can be very damaging to the cells, create some very uh, damaging things happening to DNA in their cells, and so they have to protect against too much light. And some of these pigments, do these protection mechanisms. Um, so maybe you have a plant that you uh, are actively growing. I know I have a couple of succulents that I like to grow, right? When I put them outside in the summer with that intense sunlight coming onto these plants, uh, they turn from having green leaves to like these purple leaves, right? And it's the purple are these other pigments showing through and kind of acting like a sunscreen so that plant doesn't get too much light. Last questions here. And then I think we're gonna take a break after this because uh, we all seem very tired and lethargic today. I think we could use an early break. Um, so I'll give you a, a five minutes here to answer these class questions. We'll discuss them together and then we will take a, a short break. Well, you might recognize some of these questions. Yeah. <laughs> yes, they were taken directly out of one. <laughs> Or maybe it's just more polar. So I guess the lab we get one on one is on clarity. So I think it goes B, A, and then the other two is a different number of But if you flip a couple of slides back, you can see this. Graph. Are we doing that lab? Oh, no. <laughs> we are not doing that. We have done all of our labs, basically. We're just doing the lab. Is the J term? Yeah, J term is fast and furious. This is the last thing. 
All right, let's work through these questions. First of all, what is a pigment? How do we define a pigment? It's a molecule that absorbs only certain wavelengths of light. Yeah, it's a molecule, it's absorbing light, and they're very specific as to which type of wavelength they'll absorb. Um, let's see, which photosynthetic pigments appear green when we look at a leaf? When we talk about most. Chlorophyll, right? Why do they appear appear green to the human eye? Because they don't absorb the green light. Yeah, the green light's not being absorbed, it's being reflected back out. Yeah, which is why we see it as green. All right, our third question here. All right, it's a bigger question. So we have this red algae, all right, that to us, right, looks pink to red in color, all right. Uh, these colors can be attributed to the photosynthetic pigment, right. So if we're seeing it as red and pink, it means it's being reflected back at us and not being used, right. So at what wavelength or maybe what color would you expect this pigment to be most photosynthetically active? Unlike chlorophyll that reflects green, so it's being reflecting like red. So what are they using? Would it be like the 500 to 600 range that they would absorb? 
Yeah, yeah, because Brett is more like on a like six, 600, 650-ish range. Um, so they're not absorbing the red because it's re being reflected back. So it's everything besides that red. Yeah, so five to 600, definitely. Even in those uh, lower wavelengths, they're probably absorbing the blue, right? Yeah, very nice. So they're absorbing what they're not reflecting. Right? How do you think we could measure this and figure out what wavelengths they're actually absorbing? We didn't talk about this. Any hypothesized ways that you would try to measure this? All right, so what if we, let me think about how to phrase this. So we want to know what wavelength it's going to be active at, right? So if it's active, what is it going to be doing with these wavelengths? It might be reflecting what they're not using, right? And what they are using, they're going to be using to for photosynthesis. They're going to be active, right? And so what we could do... Right? And I purposely didn't tell you what this experiment would be. Um, but what we could do is we could expose these plants to different colors of wavelengths, right? getting rid of everything else, exposing them to just one wavelength at a time, and seeing, are they photosynthetic at that wavelength? Right? And so for our red algae here, right? it's pink to red. If I gave them red light, probably wouldn't be photosynthetic. They wouldn't be active. If I gave them like green or blue, we would probably see some activity. Yeah, like I said, there are machines that do that. Um, we have a couple of them here in our department. Right? Um, let's see. So the last question here is ranking the energy of our different lights here. So which one has the highest amount of energy associated with them? Blue light. Blue light, yes. Uh, what about the middle amount of energy? green light, and that means the highest yeah. is red light, yes. We're thinking about the wavelengths associated um, and how far apart they are. All right, let's take, let's take a 15 minute break here. Uh, we'll come back here at 11.15. Has anyone checked on their plants yet today? No. No? I haven't checked that the door is unlocked. I think it is, but I'm going to walk over and double check. <laughs> Let's do so. So let's continue our discussion on light here. And like I said, we're going to reserve photosynthesis for tomorrow because it's, it's a lot. Um, but we're going to talk about other ways plants use light. And one of the common questions I get asked is, well, we know plants use visible light, but what happens if they're exposed to light outside of the visible spectrum? Right? Um, well, we do and we don't know what happens, right? So there's some studies, it's still an ongoing area of research. With UV light though, typically, um, we're gonna see some reduced growth, right? We're gonna have lower amounts of photosynthesis, um, smaller biomass, because they're, they're growing less. Uh, gamma rays, right? Gamma rays can actually penetrate into the cells themselves, right? And that can cause a variety of things, right? It can soften fruits, um, it can break down the cell walls, right? It can influence development and function, typically a, a negative way, right? So a variety of things can happen with those gamma rays. Those longer wavelengths, right? this is where there's not as much research out there. So we're talking like radio and microwave wavelengths. 
in general, what I have found is that we get less healthy looking plants, right? Though the research done on this has not been very extensive. Uh, so one of the lines of research that I found, uh, they looked at uh, these trees, right? And they saw a tree uh, that looked nice and healthy, but then they saw this tree that was growing next to a transmitter, right? Uh, transmitting some of these radio and microwave wavelengths and they just saw that it looked a little less healthy, right? Not a lot of science to back up their claims though. They're just saying, oh, this is what I'm seeing, right? It might be the radio, radio waves. It might be something completely different, right? Uh, but we think they have a negative effect. Research to be determined there. Other ways that plants use light, right? Well, they, they use light a lot. Uh, so germination, right? Some plants actually need to sense that there is light around them before they will germinate, right? They need a light cue to germinate. Other plants don't need this. Other plants, if you put seeds in the dark, they will germinate just fine, right? Our radish seeds growing in our gravity experiment is a great example of this, right? We're not giving them light. They are still germinating, right? But some plants, they need that light cue before they will grow out of the seed. Um, flowering, right? So the length of day uh, will determine when a plant will flower. And we'll elaborate this on the next couple of slides here. Uh, some plants need a long amount or long daylight amount in order to flower. Other plants need a shorter daylight amount in order to flower. And then obviously growth, right? Plants need light to photosynthesize to produce those sugars. Those sugars will lead to better growth of the plant. Right? So broadly speaking, right, all of those influences of light we can say is photomorphogenesis. Right? It's a pretty long word there, um, but it's any uh, plant growth, plant development, that's been triggered by light. So germination, when to flower, um, how much it's going to grow. It would be our, our photomorphogenesis. All right, the video talked a little bit about phytochromes, right? So phytochromes are a molecule in the plant that can actually sense a certain wavelength of light. Right? These phytochromes typically sense red and far red light. So red in the visible light spectrum and then outside of the visible light spectrum we have far red light. Right? And it's going to detect the amount of those two types of light given to it. Right? And when it detects this, this is where it can tell the plant if it should germinate or how it should grow. Right? So. If these phytochromes sense a lot of red light, right? Red light, um, we're going to have our plants that will actually germinate and we'll have kind of a bushy growth, right? Red light um, means there's a lot of sunlight coming through, right? Um, regular sunlight um, saying, let's germinate. There's light available here. Uh, bushy growth, right? So it can produce lots of leaves to capture as much um, of that sunlight as possible. But uh, if it senses more of the far red light, right, this is going to indicate that there is less sunlight available for the plants. And so if it senses a lot of this far red light, it can actually inhibit germination in some plants. Right? So seeds won't even germinate because those phytochromes are not sensing enough light in order for it to germinate and do well. Right? In the plant itself, we might see that if there is a lot of far red light, right, plants might grow taller, right? And typically plants growing taller and having a lot more vertical growth rather than bushy growth is an indication that they're searching out more sunlight, right? So when there's not enough light and these phytochromes sense a lot of this far red light, the plants are gonna grow taller to search out more light sources. Okay, so these phytochromes are pretty cool in what they do. I mentioned that plants can respond uh, to light and when they flower, right? So we would say uh, 
photoperiodism, right, um, is any response to specific night or day length. It's a plant responding to the length of the day or the length of the night. Right? So flowering is a great example. When plants flower uh, is regulated by how much sunlight they get throughout the day or how long is that nighttime. Right? So plants detect these photo periods, right? these periods of light. And in this image here, we can see that some plants, right? so if we have this arbitrary line here, it's called critical night length, right? and we have a 24-hour day. Right? The light is in yellow here, and darkness is in this dark blue. If the light for this specific plant is less than this critical night length, right? so we have a, a kind of a, a short day or maybe a long night here, the plant will flower. Right? which is different than other plants. Other plants, they don't like these short day lengths. They have to have a long day length. All right? So light that goes past this critical night length. Right? And when that happens, they will flower. Right? So we're sensing the amount of daylight. Right? Kind of a way that plants can uh, respond to the seasons. Right? Spring and fall, we tend to have shorter days rather than uh, midsummer here. That's why we see flowers throughout the entire spring, summer, fall season because plants are responding differently to the amount of light they're getting. Right. Just to kind of elaborate on that, right, so I said a short day plant is a plant that flowers when uh, day length is shorter than a critical number of hours. And right. this critical number of hours can vary which is why I'm not saying it's like 10 hours or eight hours. I'm just saying it's a critical night length, all right? Um, but it's gonna uh, flower when it's shorter than that critical number of uh, hours. A long day plant will flower when it's longer than that critical number of hours. But we can also have day neutral plants, right? Um, that their flowering is not gonna be determined by day length. It's determined by something else entirely, right? So they'll be unaffected by the day length. Okay. Now we can see in these images too, right? so if we take a look at this short day of light, right? we can see that in this experiment they actually manipulated the amount of light. Right? So this plant likes a short day, right? a short amount of light. So if we give it a short amount of light, right? but then we give it a flash of light in the middle of the nighttime, it actually doesn't flower. Okay. Same with this long day plant. This long day plant likes a lot of light. Okay? If we give it a short day amount of light, so not enough to make it flower, okay? but give it a flash of light in the middle of the night, it actually will flower. Okay? And that's because even though these plants are named short day and long day plants, okay, it's actually nighttime that is more critical and what they're responding to than the daytime. Right? So we at first thought it was daylight, and then we did these experiments and realized they're actually responding to the amount of darkness they get. So if we give a short day plant a little flash of light in the dark, right, it's not getting that critical length of nighttime to tell it to flower. Right? Same with this long day plant. We give it a flash of light in the middle of the night, it's thinking that it actually has a longer day than it actually does. Right? So it's kind of an interesting um, interesting thing that researchers found over time, uh, that even though we named them by day length, they're actually more influenced by night length. All right, uh, phototropism. Right? So how plants are going to orient themselves in response to light. I briefly mentioned this when we talked about the gravitropism lab here. Right? Uh, so phototropism is a response in a, towards a stimuli. It's a type of tropism, right? And it's the way that the plant will orient itself to, um, to the light or in response to the light. So here again, we see an, a window and we see the stems actively turning, right? And going towards that window, right? It's exhibiting what's called positive phototropism because it's growing towards that light, right? Uh, so stems, 
right? Leaves will exhibit positive phototropism. Yeah. But plants can also exhibit this negative phototropism, right? Where they're growing away from the light. And so if we think about all the different plant organs, roots. Roots will grow away from the light, right? Because they're trying to anchor themselves deeper into the soil. Yeah, negative phototropism, positive phototropism here. And we have this molecule that actually plays a huge role in the process by which plants can turn themselves away or towards the light. Right? This hormone is called auxin. Right? It's actually a group of hormones that we broadly classify as auxin hormones. Right? And they regulate whether cells will grow long or not. So they regulate cell elongation. Okay. And auxin is actually produced at the tip of the plant. Right. So if we have plant growing here, auxin is produced at the tip. Right. And so I'm going to walk us through a study that helped researchers understand the role that auxin is playing here and where auxin is produced. So if we have a series of these plants and a bunch of different experiments. So this visual is summarizing a, a couple of different major experiments where they did several different things to the plant. Right? First of all, they had their control. They let this plant grow normally. Right? Uh, they gave it light coming from one direction and they saw that the plant started to curve towards that light. Right? The next thing that they did was they cut off the tip of the plant. Right? So they removed the tip of the plant, and they saw that this plant did not respond to the light. All right, so that indicates that something's going on uh, with the tip of the plant. Right? This plant tip is playing an important role. They then covered the tip of the plant. Right? So instead of cutting it off, they covered it uh, by a cap that does not let in sunlight. And they found that, once again, didn't have any response to light. They then covered the plant tip with a cap. Right? But this time this cap let in the sunlight, and they found that once again this plant started to curve towards the light. Right? So it's something with light, right? Light interacting with the tip of this plant. Right? They, uh, right, they're covering all their bases here. So they uh, covered actually the uh, stem part or the base of the plant just to make sure it wasn't the base playing a role in this. Right? And they found that it still grew towards the light, so they can rule out the base having uh, much of an impact here. They then cut the tip off, right? And this is a, a different set of researchers here. They cut the tip off, right? But then they put it back onto the plant, but they separated it with this layer that still allowed the plant to communicate with its tip, even though it was severed, it could still communicate with the tip of the plant, right? And because communication could still occur, it grew towards the light. They did the same thing, but now this layer did not allow for communication between the tip of the plant and the rest of the plant. And they found that when, even though this tip is exposed to light, there's no communication, the plant did not respond. Right? So all these experiments are indicating that there's something going on with the tip of the plant, and we now know that it's because auxin is being produced there. And so when we get light on one side, right? this hormone, auxin, is going to tell the plant to elongate the cells on the dark side of the plant, which causes the plant to curve, right? So if one side is elongating and the other side isn't, that's gonna cause one side to grow a little faster, which then curves towards that light, right? So pretty cool uh, way that the plants respond to this using this, this hormone. I wanted to end by doing a, a quick group project and how do we apply to what, everything we've learned here to space, right? And I want you to take four minutes here, work with partner, um, look at these links, and answer the question, why don't we use sunlight to grow plants on the International Space Station, right? They're closer to the sun than we are. Why don't we use sunlight? Uh, so take a couple uh, minutes to look at these couple of links here. They're very short links.
it's all a yak and you're trying to get to someone like the only one that knows what it's like besides all the colleagues. And there's not a lot of resources to get to them. I like how you wouldn't believe it until someone else would say it.
Yeah, yeah. That that night and day cycle can get really messed up, and some uh, functions of the plant really rely on the amount of light and darkness. Is there anything else that we found? Um, in space, you want to be like as most efficient as possible, and so they're just instead of use purple light because it's the red and blue wavelengths in order to increase efficiency. Yeah, yeah, they're using specifically the wavelengths that plants need um, to be efficient, right? If they don't need green light, let's not give them green light. Um, anything else? I think we covered it all. Um, I like this one because a lot of you might have um, plants growing on spaceships that use windows in your pop culture piece. And so now you know why that might not be the best way to do so. Uh, all right. Let me see. Let me go to my homework tab here. Uh, so we have a Gardeners of the Galaxy episode, a uh, podcast episode to listen to here. Um, video on photosynthesis, which will be part of the quiz material here. That scientific literature assignment is due tomorrow if you haven't already done it. Um, upcoming here, right? the annotated bibliography we talked about is due on the 18th, so in two days here. And then I'm also going to assign you a, yet another assignment, but I promise it's fun. It's very interactive. right? An assignment of uh, watching a video called How to Grow a Planet. right? Um, I have some questions linked up on Moodle for you to work through as you watch the video. Um, I'm having that due on Friday to give you some time to plan out when you want to do it and watch this video. I can't remember how long it is. I want to say it's an hour and a half. Um, I'm having you watch part one of this three-part series. All right. You can watch parts two and three. That's fine. I'm really having you focus on part one. Um, I know it's on Daily Motion, which is not like... YouTube or something nicer, um, but that's literally the only place I can find this. Even the library itself here has a hard time finding this resource, but it's such a good resource and I love watching it. Um, so hopefully you'll get something out of it. Um, maybe thinking about terraforming planets in what, a couple hundred years here maybe. Maybe sooner than that, who knows. Any questions on that assignment? Yeah. Uh, it's currently in Moodle as being due uh, tonight. Due tonight? Uh, I changed the text part. I did not change the Moodle setting. Thank you for letting me know. Um, I, I kind of switched around. I imported a lot of settings from last year, and I switched around when this was due. I will go ahead and change that once we start our discussion here. Um, but since there are no more questions, let's start our discussion of endurance. Let's see. I once again forgot to bring up cards to help us randomize. So I know I started over there last time with one through four. Emily, what group did do you remember what group you ended up in last time? I remember what group right here. <laughs> so oh, one. All right. Um Brian, let's start with you at number one, and we'll go the opposite direction. Hopefully that randomizes things a little bit. Wait, one, two, All right, and we'll have the same placement as last time. We're one, two, three, and four. And I'll have you work through your discussion questions first again, and then I'll, I'll pull up some uh, larger questions up on the board here. <laughs> 